All right. You should see a title slide. Yes, good. All right. Excellent. Well, um, you know, I, I talked to Dan a couple of weeks ago, and uh, I'd seen some excellent talks lined up that were very timely because of the uh, impending field day. Uh, and he, I noticed that there was one topic that didn't seem to be covered, uh, but it's one that seems to come up a lot when I talk to groups on uh, field day. Uh, and that was uh, interference between stations. Now, there are some things that are probably fairly obvious. Um, and that is, well, for, for example, I, I visited one field day as I was a vice director for nine years, I used to hit, uh, you know, 15 to 20 field days every, uh, every weekend. And I'd go to one and uh, they had a, a park that was almost a, a mile on a size, lots of spacing there. And I went up to uh, the, the lead folks and said, how's it going? It's all pretty good, but boy, we're getting a lot of interference between the stations. I said, oh, what band are you on? They said, oh, we're on 20 phone. So I hiked down to the another corner of the park and said, oh, uh, what band are you on? Oh, we're on 20 CW. And then I hiked to another part of the corner and I said, hey, what, what band are you on? And they said, well, we're on 20 uh, digital. I said, I think I know what your problem is. So, um, but, but certainly, uh, you know, you, you can be on multiple, uh, multiple modes on one band. We'll talk about that a little bit. The main thing I want to talk about today is interference between stations, mostly on different bands. Now, clearly this is designed to be uh, applied in the coming field day here. However, there are a lot of other instances where this can be an issue. One is multi-operator contest stations. Uh, field days are usually running around 100 watts or so, 150 watts at the most, but uh, contest stations can be running kilowatts. <clears throat> uh, the expeditions can be running uh, kilowatts. Uh, I know because I've been on a dozen and a half or more of them. And, uh, you know, we have lots of antennas in a small space and stations sometimes pretty close together. So we have to deal with it. Another possibility is emergency operation centers where you have multiple radios going on. If you have amateur co-located with commercial gear, uh, there could be interference issues between these stations. Uh, even handhelds and mobile to mobile can be an issue. So. Uh, this is the Caltech JPL field day up on Mount Gleason at about 8,000 feet. Uh, I was one of their main operators and hardware guys for about uh, 10 or 11 years. It was a lot of fun uh, and we had some pretty good hardware and we managed to operate without, without killing one another. Um, now you get to something like this. This is a contest station. It happens to be uh, uh, just outside uh, Zagreb, Croatia, and uh, I was there for a CQ Worldwide uh, DX contest, and they're all running kilowatts, and as you can see, a lot of antennas, and of course, there you're pointing all over the world, so uh, you can't really uh, necessarily keep out of somebody's pattern, but they managed to do it pretty well. So there are really two sources of the problem. One is a fault of the transmitter. You may have harmonics, spurs, phase noise. Uh, so these are all transmitter issues. And then on the receiver side, you have receivers being overloaded from otherwise clean and valid signals. Adding to the problem, um, we have many, many harmonically related bands. Uh, this is actually by design. This is how it helped hams uh, uh, get on multiple bands in the early days and you, you know, 80, has harmonics on the, all these bands here, 40, 20, 15, 10, 40 on going up, 20 meters has a harmonic on 10, two meters has a third harmonic on 432, 70 centimeter has a third harmonic on 1296. So these things that we've often used as advantages can present additional issues when you're trying to run multiple stations. So I think the first piece of advice is to start with the best radios you can get. Um, this is a little piece written up by uh, Rob Sherwood. Uh, those of you who are at all into receiver performance should know Rob NC0B. Uh, uh, and he wrote this on the Elecraft Reflector back some years ago. He says, an engineer that belongs to the Boulder Amateur Radio Club recently ran some field day simulations to compare phase noise with some popular rigs. 
since it's common to have CW and sideband on the same band um, for field day, that's what the test was meant to simulate, 80 or 100 kilohertz separation. The difference between the best and the worst rigs was 20 dB. That's a factor of 100. So you can see where uh, clean transmitters uh, are not a given. Uh, there's a great variation. So you want to keep your transmitter clean. First thing I always advise people is to turn the speech processor either down or off. I almost never use speech processors. I find them a pain and it's more difficult to get them adjusted and still sound good and have a clean signal. Um, uh, second is to use good microphone technique. You know, don't swallow the mic. Um, try, to, try to maintain an appropriate distance. And as I tell even a new operator, have other people give you reports on how you sound as you hold the microphone close, a little further to the side and so on until you find out what works. Uh, a lot of modern radios, if they have microphone gain, it's buried in a menu somewhere. And if you've got a visiting operator, they may have no idea how to figure that out. If you're going to run digital modes, typically along with uh, either CW or sideband on a, on a, on a given band, uh, make sure you run those at reduced power. They don't need, I mean, they, they work fine on very low power. So you can at least reduce the, um, the uh, level uh, that you're generating that might interfere with one of the other mode stations. Uh, now, we talk about receiver performance. Uh, this also is from uh, Rob Sherwood. Uh, here, I just picked a couple out of his big table, a couple of the uh, fairly top uh, stations uh, listed for close-in dynamic range. That is, um, how strong a signal can you have near you and still hear a weak signal? Um, the Flex 6700, the K3S, TS890, these are all in the 105 dB plus range. Uh, down at the bottom, near the bottom, ICOM 706 Mark G, ICOM 756, the old Collins 75 S3. These things are up maybe a thousand times or more worse in terms of close in dynamic range than the some of these radios up at the top. So uh, again, uh, they're not all created equal. Uh, I've visited stations that have 10, 15, or more transmitters going at the same time without interference. And uh, usually I would find, for example, they're almost all running Elecraft K3s or something like that. So, uh, you know, good radios go a long way toward solving the problem before you have to try and do something else to get rid of the problem. You, you solve the problem by not generating it in the first place. The next tool you have at hand is antenna placement. Um, physical antenna spacing, of course, helps a lot. It makes you sure you stay within the, uh, the boundaries uh, designated by the field day rules. But if you can, try to keep the day band antennas separated from one another, keep the night band antennas separated from one another. And very importantly, try to use the nulls that are in every antenna's pattern. I mean, it, in the di case of a dipole, it's just off the end, but uh, you know, Yaggies off the sides. Yes, you have you have a decreased uh, uh, decreased uh, performance in the back, but the best nulls are usually off the sides. So if you can kind of run them along an imaginary line, that that can go a long way. Um, you may, if you're going to operate in band with another mode. Uh, try to cross polarize. One uses a beam, one uses a dipole or a, a vertical, for example. So if you can, have your antennas oriented like this at the top where they're off to each other's side. You're, you're taking the advantage of the nulls in both patterns, as opposed to down here where each one is beaming into the, you know, into or being beamed into by the other one. Um, much better isolation if you do this up top. Now in Southern California here and probably in the, um, in the Northeast and certain other places, the corners of the country, you can get away with out using rotators. You leave your antennas more or less in one position here. We point them about 70 degrees and leave them. There are no multipliers in field day. So you don't worry about having to turn to get a KL7. If you hear them, you hear them and that's fine. Uh, also the patterns on the antennas typically used in field day aren't really that sharp. <clears throat> so you don't have to worry about, you know, your laser beam missing a, a big pocket of contacts. 
if you're in the middle of the country, you're probably going to have to rotate them around. But again, pick, pick the directions that are most likely um, going to be used. And if you can get your antennas so that they are in that top kind of configuration where they're both, you know, you're, typically you're 10 and 15, for example, 15 and 20 may be pointed more or less in the same direction most of the time. Um, so if you can make those um, the most common directions that you use, uh, can place the antennas so that they're side to side, uh, that'll help a lot. Now, good filters can do an awful lot for you. Um, uh, the uh, LC, you know, discrete component bandpass filters are readily available for uh, pretty much any band you're going to use on field day. Uh, the top is example of a uh, uh, <clears throat> NQN design a bandpass filter, uh, and this particular one is for 15 meters. Uh, I have a set, one for each of the uh, six HF bands. We take them along with us on expeditions. Now these are typically rated at around 200, 150 to 200 watts. So you can't put them on the output of an amplifier, but of course on field day, you're not using amplifiers. Uh, when we do our de-expeditions, we have these uh, right at the output of the rig, and then we have another solution, which I'll go over in a moment, uh, that works on the amplifiers, but can also be used just on a transceiver. Down at the bottom here is a DCI filter. I think this one's for uh, two meters. Uh, these are kind of expensive, but they are very good. I'll show you the patterns in a minute. Okay, here's that uh, NQN design. This is the 20 meter filter, and you can see the attenuation is virtually zero. It's just negligible uh, within the band of interest, uh, you know, 20 meters here. But you go down to seven megahertz, here's the 40 meter band, you're down 60 dB plus, you go up to 15 meters, you're down uh, 60 dB plus, uh, you go up to 10 meters, you're at 90 dB plus. Okay, so you're talking about uh, one millionth to one billionth of the possible uh, harm, harmful signal getting to the other side. And of course, they these work both ways. They protect you from transmitted, your, the 20 meter station in this case would be protected from transmitted signals as well as any spurs that may be generated uh, will be attenuated before they go out the antenna and possibly get picked up by the other station. So you see why we think these filters are really valuable to have. Now we talked about the DCI filter. Here's, here's the pattern there. Uh, this is centered on 146, so here's your two meter band. And as you see, as it falls away, 60, 70, 80 dB, okay. So this is the sort of thing that will really help you avoid um, having another signal interfere with that station. Uh, DCI interestingly makes a, a version of the two meter, a couple of versions in fact, of the two meter filter that cover only the bottom two megahertz, 144 to 146. So theoretically you could have one station on uh, 146, uh, 52 or whatever simplex frequency you want. And then you could have a weak signal station for uh, CW and, and uh, uh, sideband and uh, maybe some of the digital modes using one of these other, these two megahertz wide filters instead of this four megahertz wide one. And you would have uh, probably negligible interference. Uh, these filters can also be used, and I have, I have several, I have them for just about every, all the VHF, UHF bands, uh, accumulated them over the years. And if you're up on a hilltop where there are commercial radio uh, activities there, uh, they can be really helpful to help keep the, uh, the commercial junk out of your receiver and help you hear a lot better. So these bandpass filters are, uh, are really remarkable. And <clears throat> I've seen, uh, I was on one situation where uh, we have a hospital that had a, uh, a radio room that also had their commercial, uh, uh, you know, the, the, their uh, building, uh, you know, their building folks and everything else were using these handhelds uh, not too far in frequency away. So uh, the end, the ultimate solution ended up in addition to cleaning up their antennas and making sure that they were squeaky clean and the coax was good was to install a, uh, a DCI bandpass filter uh, right at the back of the rig 
And that really kept the commercial gear, even though it was right nearby, uh, from, from interfering with them. Okay, I mentioned earlier that the, uh, the lump constant filters can't really be used on, uh, on amplifiers. Uh, that's not exactly true. There, there are some, there, is, there are a couple of companies who are making, mostly over in Eastern Europe, who are making filters that are designed to run at the multi-kilowatt level. However, those are big and bulky and very expensive. So uh, there is another thing that you can do, and that is to build what's called a stub filter. Uh, stub filters basically involve putting a T connector in the line uh, coming out of your transmitter or amplifier. And uh, into that T, and uh, eventually the, it keeps going on to the, uh, the antenna or the switch or whatever. But if you have the, uh, the stub tuned properly, you'll be able to get easily 20 dB of attenuation. I've gotten 26, 27 dB out of those things. And that's like a factor of 100 or better. So that's pretty good. They're made basically from coax and, if, and a few connectors. Uh, you can use the formulas to get close. Uh, and of course, you have to use the cable's velocity factor because you're going to be cutting electrical quarter wavelengths and electrical half wavelengths. Um, so because the lengths are approximate, usually you cut it a little long and then you fine tune. Uh, if you have a signal generator and uh, like a HP 415 uh, meter, you can do that. If you have a spectrum analyzer and signal generator, you can do that. Um, if you just uh, stick a receiver out there, you, you can listen. But one way or the other, you can get pretty, you can get very close. Uh, in the case of shorting, you know, cutting it off and making sure there are no shorting wires, that's easy. And you just go a little, you know, maybe quarter inch by quarter inch as you're getting close. Um, if you need a shorted stub, you take a, a probe a sharp probe and you shove it in there and short it out on purpose. And if that's, you get close to the spot, then you cut it and make it a permanent connection with, you know, wrapping the wire around the center and, and uh, soldering and everything. Uh, importantly, when you're going to build these stubs, a lot of them look pretty much alike. So you have to make sure to label which band they're intended for, because if you put them on the wrong band, they will be a short circuit and your radio will not be happy. Okay, the basic principles behind the stub filter is that a shorter, a shorted quarter wave length of coax has a high impedance on the operating band, but a low impedance on the even harmonic bands, uh, where it's either a shorted half wave or a multiple of shorted half waves. Conversely, an open half wave length of coax has high impedance on the operating band, but a low impedance on subharmonic bands where it's an open quarter wave length. So let's look at how these things are built. Um, for the 80 meter station, you have coming from the radio, it's going to the antenna, here's your stub. Now, I, I, these examples are all based using RG213, which has a velocity factor of around 0.659 or 0.66. If you're using, for example, a foam dielectric coax uh, or a Teflon dielectric coax, uh, the velocity factor will be closer to maybe 0.8 and so uh, you'll, the actual proper lengths will be longer. But again, this is very easy to calculate. So what you have here, we have about 45 feet. How did I get the 45 feet? Well, quarter wavelength uh, on uh, 80 meters is 70.3 feet. You apply the velocity factor, it's about 46 feet. So it's an electrical quarter wavelength. You short it. That means it's, it's uh, uh, high impedance at, for the uh, primary band for the 80 meter station. And it, it, it's invisible. Uh, it doesn't affect your SWR or anything. It's just like it wasn't there. But it's a shorted half wave on 40 meters, a shorted one wavelength on 20 meters, two shorted wavelengths on 10 meters, and so on. And it's a shorted one and a half wave on 15. So this one stub will attenuate any possible signals coming out or coming back in from 40, 20, 15, and 10. So. Easy, very easy. Likewise, the 15 meter station uh, needs only one stub. And uh, this is going to be uh, about 23 feet. So on 15 meters, 
it's a shorted three quarters of a wavelength. Remember, if it's a shorted quarter wave or a shorted three, any odd number of quarter wavelengths, uh, it's the same. It's a high impedance and the radio doesn't even notice it. It doesn't affect your SWR uh, as, as seen at the radio. But it's a shorted half wave on 20 meters and it's a shorted wavelength on 10 meters. So they, this will attenuate 20 and 10 meters with having no effect on 15. I didn't show 160, by the way, but almost nobody uses 160 on field day, but it's the same as the 80 or this thing. The only difference is it's about 93 feet long instead of 46 or 23. So you see how easily a shorted quarter wave can really help uh, isolate those stations. Now, when you get to 20 meters, uh, a little more, because now you have, <clears throat> you have a subharmonic that you're worried about 40 because 40 and 20 can certainly be open at the same time. And then you have the, the higher uh, bands to worry about as well. So you start with uh, a uh, half wavelength on 20 that's open. And again, open half wavelength, uh, high impedance, just like a shorted quarter wavelength. But that's an open quarter wavelength on 40 meters. And it's three quarters of an open wavelength on 15 meters. So 40 and 15 are nulled by this open here. Now you still got to take care of 10. Well, you go back to the same old routine. Shorted quarter wave uh, at the uh, operating frequency is a shorted half wave uh, at the first harmonic. Or this, uh, you know, the double, double the frequency or, uh, on 10 meters. So in this case, it's only 11 and a half feet. So now you're looking about, you know, total again, about, um, you know, 35 feet or so of coax and you've got that band taken care of. You're starting to wonder how much coax you're going to need for all of these. Uh, a 300 foot roll will basically make you stub filters for all six HF bands. Uh, if you don't need 160, then you're down to about 200 feet. All right, 10 meters also uses two stubs. But remember, a shorted quarter wave uh, is effective on higher frequencies on, on you know, multiple multiples of the operating frequency. And uh, we really don't have HF bands above 10 meters, so we don't have to worry about that. The other bands aren't close enough to be, uh, to be harmonically related. So now we have to worry about bands below 10 meters, lower in frequency, and that's where that open stub comes in. So we're gonna have two stubs here. We're gonna have 23 feet, of RG213. Um, that's uh, a basically a, an open quarter wavelength on 40 and three quarters of an open wavelength on 15. And then you have uh, the short stub is a quarter wavelength on 20. But of course on 10, it's a short uh, open, I'm sorry, this is open also, uh, but it's an open half wave on 10. So, um, you know, open half wave or an open full wave uh, either way, 10 meters doesn't even notice that it's there. The probably the most difficult one to deal with is 40 meters. Uh, you're gonna need three stubs here. Um, first, you have your 23 feet, which nulls, uh, it's shorted, this nulls uh, 20 meters and 10 meters, the uh, second harmonic and the fourth harmonic. Then you've got uh, the middle stub uh, nulls 15 meters because that's that's three times the frequency and these these stubs generally only work on on uh, you know mul even multiple harmonics so you need a separate stub to short 15 meters now if you just have this it'll null 15 just fine but the problem is it's not a high impedance on the 40 meter station so you throw one more stub in it's about a little under eight feet open and that will essentially be the other part of this, which turns it as far as the 40 meter station goes, it turns it into a, uh, uh, you know, a uh, open, uh, open uh, half wave. So that keeps it from, um, you know, that, that keeps the SWR clean. Uh, by the way, I've tried this trick uh, uh, way back when I first started doing some uh, mountain topping for VHF and UHF contests. I use this same concept uh, for keeping two meters out of 432 because that's a three to one frequency relationship. 
and keeping 432 out of 1296, because that's also a three to one relationship. So I, I used good, uh, I think it was RG114. It's, it's, it'll handle like five or 10 kilowatts. It's Teflon tape and so on. And silver, you know, double silver braid and silver plated uh, center conductor. And it's really big and beefy. And I just happened to have some, a, a chunk of that surplus. So I, I cut and trimmed them a bit. And then I had some help from uh, Chip Angle, N6CA, a well-known uh, VHF contester uh, here. And uh, we, he's, he stuck it on his, uh, on his uh, network analyzer and we were able to kind of just tweak it in to where uh, this set of stubs would, just using these, would cover the uh, two meter to 432 problem and then even shorter to cover the 432 to 1296 problem. And they did work. And again, they're completely passive. Unfortunately, you know, I'll be sending the uh, slides deck here to, uh, uh, to Dan so that uh, you guys can download it and look at it. Uh, you don't have to, you know, hurriedly note the calculations or the lengths. And remember, the, the coax you use will affect the actual lengths. You, and uh, you'll find that it's really not very hard to zero in on right where you want them. Now, somebody says, well, what about the difference between the lengths for the phone band and the CW end of the band? Um, usually that doesn't matter much. Uh, on 80 meters, potentially it could, but uh, <clears throat> you know, it, I find that if I cut it for the CW end of the band, because that's where virtually everybody is going to be operating somewhere in your harmonic, um, the phone end takes care of itself. Uh, they're wide enough that you don't need to do that. Uh, the depth of the null will vary with the kind of coax you use. Uh, uh, the lower loss, the coax, the sharper the null, but it also tends to be slightly narrower. Uh, I have made these stubs out of RG58 for field days. I've made them out of LMR400 for the uh, W6UE, the Caltech station where we used to do multi-multis from there. Again, all the antennas near each other and, and everybody in one room. Uh, I've made them out of RG213. I made them out of RG142, which is, uh, it's the size of RG58, but it's uh, silver, tef silver coated and Teflon dielectric and so on. And it can take several kilowatts. So, and, and it weighs under four pounds per hundred feet, uh, as opposed to 10 pounds per hundred feet for, you know, for the, uh, for the uh, RG213. And if you're packing all this stuff up in a suitcase, you got six bands worth of stubs, it's 300 feet. Uh, it's better to have it light than have it, uh, have it big and thick. So you've got a lot of options uh, based on what you have available. Um, when you're using these filters, uh, you have to be sure that you change the filter when you change the band. If you have one station that, that is going to cover more than one band, maybe a daytime band and a nighttime band, that's fairly common in field day. If you're running, you know, one or two or three transmitters, uh, some of them are going to have to do duty on multiple bands. So make sure that when you change the band, you change the filter. Now, if you're do, using a coax switch, say, to go, maybe you, your daytime station is uh, 15 and the nighttime station is 40, okay? Uh, you can, uh, you have your coax switch, put the filter just on the antenna end of the, of the switch, not on the radio side. So when you switch to the other antenna, the, that, the proper filter is already there. That's kind of the safe way to do it. Again, it, it looks, if you have it in the wrong band, it looks like a dead short and you don't want to do that. So that's pretty much it for the, uh, for the sharing of the screen and the, and the regular PowerPoint. So let's go ahead and see if there are questions coming out of that or ideas of other things people have done uh, to impact their, their minimal interference. Okay, first question, does it matter how far apart the stubs are on the main transmitter line? Uh, good question. Uh, not, not really, not, not in terms of how each one works with respect to the others, but you should keep them close together. And the important thing, um, it, if you're just using, uh, using them on a barefoot radio, it's best to put them uh, close as close to the 
transmitter output as possible. If you can get it within, you know, a foot or so, that's great. Um, if you're running an amplifier, uh, then where you put them can be even more um, important. If you're running an amplifier with a, a PIL network, uh, normally you put them as close as possible to the amplifier. If you're running a Pi network output, as some amplifiers have, um, then the um, the low impedance point for the harmonic isn't right at the output. It may be uh, an eighth of a wavelength on the operating band away. So you may have to move it out a ways. Um, if you're not sure, uh, do some experimenting, you know, be listening on the other end, uh, or maybe ideally I have a signal sampler that I can use just before the coax goes into a dummy load. And then you can watch either listen on a receiver or watch it on a, on a spectrum analyzer and move the stub around, you know, close and move it a little further out and see where the most effective spot is. Good question. Thanks. Jed has a question. I'm not exactly sure what he means. It says, are these straight coax runs or question mark? Okay. Uh, yes, everything is just straight pieces of coax. Um, and again, you, you, uh, you'll have typically from the output of the radio, you'll have a short uh, jumper that will go into your, uh, either into your uh, filter, stub filter or into a switch or whatever. And then you have another piece, the, the antenna connection will go in the other end. And these two, one, two, or three, depending on how many pieces you have, they're just straight pieces of coax with connectors on them. And frankly, you could probably, especially at the lower HF bands, you could do this without connectors. You could just, uh, you know, stick it in an aluminum box, uh, connect the input and the output with a piece of wire, and, uh, you know, run, uh, run uh, the other pieces, just, you know, solder the middle and, and let them go that way. So you could hardwire it. Uh, but it's a lot more convenient to do it with connectors. Okay. That's all in the chat. Oscar, you have your, question, your hand up. Yeah, I do have a question. How do you trim them? I mean, I'm sure that you do the calculations, but you want it to be the null quite on the center where you expect to work. Yeah. Um, you have a lot of space, especially in 80 and 40 meters. Mm -hmm. And also you want, normally you, you want to go, let's say Japan or something like that, that you want to be in that frequencies as well in 50 meters as well. So how you train them to, to be perfectly, uh, because the stop are open or closed, short, they are quite narrow. Uh, they're actually not that narrow. Um, uh, I found that, uh, as I say, I, I cut mine for the CW end of the band, maybe around uh, like on 80, I would cut it for maybe 35, 50, 35. 3580, somewhere in there. And that's pretty much good for the whole band. Remember, by the time you get up to, you know, uh, 3.9 megahertz or something, now your harmonics fall outside the, uh, the upper bands. Uh, the, uh, the other bands are, are small enough in terms of, you know, percentage of frequency that it's much less of an issue. Uh, so I, I would normally, and, and because some of our ex contest expeditions are, are for CW. I usually cut them for CW again, because the harmonics will almost always fall within the operating range of the higher bands, but they're, they're plenty broad. They'll, they'll, they'll cover pretty much the whole band, especially where you're going to operate it you know, on a field day. You're going to be in the kind of the contest parts of the band. Um, there's really no problem with being too narrow. Thank, Thank you. Great presentation. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Raise your hands or put the questions in the chat. Anybody what? else have anybody else have ideas on uh, how they have resolved some uh, interference issues? I'd like to you know, be able, like to find out if there are other things that I haven't figured out yet. And then Mark, oh, you mentioned you mentioned the filters. For example, I used to use the ice. Uh, remember the ice uh, engineering mm -hmm. uh, filters? They they used to work very well, but they were limited to uh, two hundred uh, watts. So we have right. to be on the radio uh, output, uh, actually, not on the amplifier. Uh, at the same time, they came with one system that uh, you have to be extremely careful that you have all the filters in one little box, so you were able to select them. So, but <coughs> but they work great. Right, you could uh, the the ICE actually are. are were less effective than the NQN style. They worked, but uh, the, the curves are a little better on, on, on some of the others. 
Um, the the filters are also used, those bandpass filters for HF, like the silver one, you know, aluminum box ones I showed, uh, they are also used if you're ever gonna use a triplexer. For example, uh, let's say you have a, 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 a th you know, three band, you know, 20, 15 and 10 meter Yagi, and you're gonna put that up. You can run three separate stations from that fairly easily. You use a triplexer, which is you could build or buy. And then at the output of the triplexers, you have three outputs, one for each band. You put the bandpass filter on that, and that combination will allow, for example, somebody to be transmitting on 10 meters into that antenna, and you're listening to somebody on 15 or 20, you won't even know they're on. Uh, so yes, now for a single op station, uh, where you're gonna be changing bands quite a bit, often people will take all these filters, put them in a single box, and they'll use uh, the band switching signals uh, from the radio to uh, switch in the appropriate filters. But again, for things like field day and anything where you have multi-operators and multiple stations, which is the real core of this presentation, uh, that's unlikely to happen. I say the safest thing to do if you're gonna operate more than maybe a day band and a night band is uh, uh, make sure that if you, whether you're using an antenna switch or unplugging one antenna, plugging in the other, Make sure you unplug the filter and antenna combination. Keep them together. In fact, when you, when you attach the filter output to the antenna lead, you might want to just put some electrical tape around it so that nobody disconnects it by accident. That way, they're always together. Good idea. Uh, Dale wants to know, can you explain the need for the third short stub on the 40-meter filter? The third short stub on 40 meters is an impedance compensation stub. Uh, because the, fifth, the, the stub that nulls 15 meters is not a half wave, uh, a quarter wave on, on, uh, on 40, you're adding enough length to make it look like a quarter wave on 40 and therefore not screw up your SWR. Okay. Now, by the way, I am not an engineer, never have been. Uh, never had any formal electronics training. So there are people here who can explain uh, that particular impedance transformation a heck of a lot better than I can. All I can tell you is it works. You just play it on Zoom. That's right, I play one on Zoom. Uh, are these techniques written and discussed anywhere? Yeah, they've been in National Contest Journal. They've been in uh, uh, publications all over. There is a book and I'm sure it's in there. I, ha I don't have the book, but I've heard great things about it. Uh, George, Whiskey 2, Victor Juliet November uh, has written a book on uh, tackling uh, uh, interstation interference. And I'm sure it's in there. But again, you'll have the presentation. So the links and the calculations will be right there. And, you know, this is something you can take somebody who with, you know, one of your techs or, or uh, even an unlicensed person, you could have them you know, do some of the rough cutting and it can, it's good practice for putting connectors on. Uh, it could be a nice little club project. And then once you've got them ready to go and got everything labeled, you know, somebody with the right equipment can, you know, trim it down to the appropriate spot. And then once you've done either, you've, you've made sure that there's uh, clearance between the braid and the center if it's an open, or you've made sure the braid is thoroughly wrapped around the center and soldered if it's a short, and then you, you know, round it out nicely and you take some tape and or shrink wrap and you put it on there, you put the label on and it's ready to go and it'll never wear out. It'll be useful for years and years. Okay. Glenn, you have your hand up. Please go ahead. Unmute All right. Uh, so I think I did. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, hi, Marty, everybody. Uh, you know, I bought one of those uh, ARRL field day books you know it's like 50 pages or 100 pages and <clears throat> excuse me i was rather disappointed in it It pretty much just said go out and have a good time uh why aren't techniques like this and lots of other technical issues in man in like the arrl field day manual it's obviously questions that guest asked you said that and uh it's questions that i've had and other people have why is it, it just seems like it would be a logical thing to be in uh, like the ARRL, go out and have a good time on field day manual kind of a thing. Well, you know, the thing is, uh, yeah, I, I agree. It would be good to have it in a book like that. But 
everybody does field day differently. I mean, you know, it, it, for some, it's a contest. Uh, even though they say it's not a contest, uh, where are you going to find it on the website? The contest results. Ah, but uh, you know, for some, it's basically a PR opportunity with a little bit of radio thrown in. You know, it's 90% meet and greet the public and 10% radio. For others, it's a big social gathering, you know, eat and drink, and somebody sits on the radio once in a while and tunes around. For others, it's a real serious get on the air and make the most contacts you can. It's all over the place in terms of how clubs and groups approach field day. And, you know, no one book is going to apply to all of them. You know, if you're, a, if you're one or two a B, for example, you know, s single operator or two operators, you're only going to have one radio anyway, so none of this matters. So there are a lot of field day operations for which this really doesn't matter. And maybe that's why they didn't decided not to go into depth on it. But there are a lot of other decisions. I, I, I have a whole talk on field day. I just extracted a few things for this talk because uh, you've had other field day presenters. But there are a lot of uh, strategic decisions that you make long before you set up, including where you are and uh, how you're going to incorporate uh, the uh, unlicensed and newly licensed folks, uh, how much time are your best operators going to spend coaching as opposed to operating, uh, are you going to be where the public can see you or are you going to be on a mountaintop where you got good propagation? There's lots and lots of questions that have to be dealt with. And, and uh, you know, a real comprehensive field day book would address all those things, in my opinion. Okay. But I don't, feel like, else? Like, Any I don't feel like writing one. Any questions in the chat or anyone raise their hands? And we'll definitely pass that suggestion up to headquarters about getting this stuff in some Good kind of that. comprehensive field they book. <laughs> Barry's got a private uh, telephone line for it, but it's the old crank thing, you know, that's how you, that's why headquarters is always so slow, because they only got the old slow uh, crank <laughs> telephones. That's right. Okay, come on guys, we, any questions? We're here. Okay, one more. Okay, uh, nice Also, one. Along that line, you mentioned duplexers and triplexers. You know, uh, a lot of people don't know about stuff like that. There just seems like there's a lot of technical information that could get passed along. And uh, I mean, we don't we don't need something the size of the antenna book or the, you know, you know the but uh, but something that covers some real practical problems on field day. Most of us, you know, if you're running three transmitters uh, and you want to do one antenna, uh, if you want to do, you know, and then stuff we just covered, uh, stuff like that seems like it ought to be in a, in, a, in a comprehensive, really how to get out there and do field day other than setting up a go-to station and having a good time, which is all fine and dandy. We've all done that, you know, but... Uh, uh, in the interim, we've, we've got everybody talking over the top of each other and making a lot of noise and stuff. So, yeah. Speaking of making anyway. a lot of noise, uh, just to throw in a kind of a humorous comment. We've been talking about RF interference, but there's one club out here that's done generally pretty well. And I, I used to go visit them regularly uh, during my making my rounds as vice director. And they took the approach of setting up one enormous tent. I mean, this thing was... I mean, it, it must have been, uh, I don't know, uh, 120 by 40 kind of tent. Uh, and all their stations were in the same tent. And the first time I went to see them, they were all, most of them were phone, there were a few seats, but, but nobody was wearing headphones. And I thought, good God, how can they even concentrate on what's going on when there are people calling and hollering and, and everything else, and there's code going in the background and uh, and, and I kind of talked to them. I said, you know, have you ever thought about equipping everybody with headsets? Uh, and they ended up doing that. And boy, the difference walking in there <laughs> was night, night and day. Uh, uh, I, I've had ones where, where tents are, are near each other and uh, in different bands. And, and one guy is, is hollering into the microphone. Well, first, you don't have to holler. You should, if, you're, if you have to holler, something's wrong. Um, try to keep it, you know, at a moderate level for your voice for the phone stations. You'll, your voice will last longer and so on. But again, we encourage them to wear headsets so that if, because if somebody's sitting there with a the radio turned way up, if, some, if an operator's trying to operate another band, if somebody's trying to sleep, 
carry on a conversation outside, it can be really disrupting to everything. So, um, and a good set of headphones will work. You will hear a lot better in a good set of headphones than you will in any built-in speaker on a radio. So uh, just for the sake of your own ears and being able to pick out the weak stuff and not, not overload your ears for the weekend, you know, you can keep the volume down and use a good set of headphones. So that's, that's another anti-interference tip, if you will. If someone wants to know what George's call was one more time. A Whiskey 2, Victor, Juliet, November, I, if I recall correctly. Okay. And I see Oscar has his hand up. Right. And uh, Jed has a question. Again, I'm not exactly sure what he wants. Do you have a photo on this? Do I have a photo? We'll, um, be, sending out the, we'll be sending out the presentation to everybody. I, I don't, but I'm sure I could, uh, I could add one in. I mean, it, all you're going to see is uh, a T-connector with a piece of coax on it. <laughs> You know, I mean, it's nothing. It's nothing more than that. This is really simple stuff. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Oscar. Yeah, Mark. In the line of the headphone, it's extremely important that you have like a dual connector for headphones because if you get a visitor, really a, a young guy who is really interested, he won't be able to listen. But if you can hook it at it and put any any cheap headphone at, at the same time. He, he will be amazed about what's going on. And that, that is a, one of the way of attracting people into. Oh, that's a really children. good, that's a really good point. And, and uh, uh, yeah, if, if somebody, somebody can learn by sitting there and listening to the operator. Uh, and also there are a lot of field days, probably maybe even the majority where they team people up and one person is the logger and one is the operator. Uh, I've never, I've never done that. Uh, it drives me nuts because I know what I can hear, and if they can't hear what I can hear, it's going to come out bad, badly. Uh, if the logger has better ears than the operator, it works really well. Well, then he should be operating. <laughs> <laughs> but or you she. have to run turns. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but, It'd be nice, but yeah, It'd be that's nice right. to have that many uh, now, people. Now, if you, just, if you just parallel two sets of headphones, you'll probably cut the output a little bit unless you have some little matching transformer in there, but that's probably not a significant loss. There's enough, usually enough audio gain in the radio to make up for it. But yeah, good, I, good point. I, Thank I, you for bringing I, that up. I use it quite often on field, even in contesting. That's the way you train the new contesters. Very good. Thank you for bringing that up. And it was a suggestion to Google coax stub filter. You'll find pictures. There you go. Thank you, Dennis. Anyone else? Questions in the chat or raise your hand? I'm going to turn it back over to you, Dan. Okay, All thanks, right. everybody. Well, thank you. Appreciate that, Barney. Lots of experience shared, and that's what we like to do here. Share and share alike. Uh, Glenn, I'd like to make a comment. Your, your background there brings back lots and lots of memories. <laughs> are they are they active now or are they just there for for show you muted Glenn. uh no everything that you and see in the background is active and works uh okay. you can check out the vintage single side band wrong table on tuesday nights on 3895 <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Well, those radios weren't the best for CW, but they sure were the bang up single sideband radio. They they been breaking a lot of memories. Okay. Uh, is, there, is there anything else? Any more questions out there? Answers, comments? Oh, thank you for doing that. Yes, memory reality. Yes, you and Dennis. <laughs> well, thank you for uh, thank you for having thank you for having me on. Uh, I'm I'm glad to get a chance to talk about this because it, it's a lot of fun, and it's it, I I enjoy doing it too. And it's not uh, say it it's not hard, and you can get you can get new folks involved and show them the wonders of radio. I mean, you you take somebody who's never gotten past the tech license yet, and and you show them a spectrum analyzer, and you take a piece of coax and shove it on. All of a sudden, they see this notch. And then you short the end and they see the notch move. It's like magic. It's magic even to the old timer sometimes. <laughs> um, I, I've heard a couple of people have suggestions here. 
what I'd like to ask everybody, and I should do this on every meeting, if you have suggestions uh, uh, for presentations, modifications for presentations, whatever, uh, send them to us. Uh, you know, uh, ratpack.plan at gmail.com. Send them to us. We'll look at those things and see what we can do with them. We do listen, and we do try to accommodate those. So be sure to send us your ideas and critique us, um, what, you, what you think about a particular uh, presentation. We're always looking for improvements. Okay, uh, and Marty is Marty has has done several presentations. We got him on board for a couple more coming up, and he does a real good job. So anyway, uh, are there any more questions out there? Everybody wants to hear somebody besides me, I'm sure. Barry, what's it look like in the tax world? We're clear. Okay, well, five minutes close to a short of an hour, and. Uh, I don't feel like talking for five more minutes. And this is what I came by else does either. So we'll forward you to wrap this baby up. And uh, look forward to seeing everybody tomorrow for Thursday's presentation. What, what we're going to talk tomorrow? We're going to talk about DMR and emergency communications, so how it fits in and, and how to use it as, uh, digital, uh, digital voice communication. Should have a big showing and uh, a good for the pres presentators, very knowledgeable. I think it should be hot good. topic to be sure. <laughs> yes, yes. So, anyway, with that, unless again, if there's anybody else, we're going to shut her down. Look forward to seeing you guys tomorrow. Okay, Thank you all everybody, have you. stay well. Thank you, Marty. Take care. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks, Marty. Take care. Last well, 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 minute. Well. Last book comment here is uh, I always leave these sec I can close out. You can log back in, just visit each other if you know, like. I leave them open after after these meetings. So you're welcome to do that. Seventy three. Seventy three, Dan. Thanks a lot.